My name is Jesse Crimes. I am an artist, and my work is about complicating vision. So I stand before you as a convicted felon for a nonviolent drug offense. And since my return home from society, I have unintentionally become a spokesman for a lot of people you cannot see, choose not to see, or most importantly, see inaccurately. In some ways, I'm representative of the issues of mass incarceration. In other ways, I'm a complete distortion of the truth. By no means do I come from a privileged background. However, I realize that I fit three major categories of privilege in our society. I am a white, college-educated male. And I believe it's important to see in complexity so that we can see past surface representations and understand our preconceived notions and how they influence our ability to affect change. Shortly after graduating from college in 2008, I was caught with 140 grams of cocaine. When I refused to cooperate and tell on other people, the federal government increased my drug weights using hearsay evidence to 50 kilos. These are drugs that never existed and are typically referred to as ghost dope by individuals in prison. This prosecutorial tool of applying pressure to get me to cooperate or eventually accept a plea agreement increased my sentencing guideline range from 30 months to a mandatory minimum of 10 years to life. In spite of this, I still chose to not cooperate, and I chose to take responsibility for my, my own actions. They also transferred me from the prison I was in to a 23 and one hour lockdown violent offender unit. Entering into this system as a nonviolent offender was traumatic, and I began making artwork as a way to transcend this environment. So I had no access to sunlight, fresh air, or any aspects of the natural world. Purgatory is one of the first pieces I created in this environment, and it developed as I read numerous philosophical texts and newspapers. These mediated sources were one of the only ways I was able to experience the outside world. So I began thinking about this process of receiving information. And as an artist and a criminal, I wanted to use the materials of the prison against itself. So I began thinking of prison-issued soap and its function as a material of sanitation, cleansing, and purification, and how that relates to ideas of rehabilitation, repentance, and the penitentiary. I began transferring images of offenders onto the surface of the soap, leaving the inverse trace of the original image. These original depictions of offenders in the newspaper represent an individual at one point in time, and they do not effectively represent that individual's entire being. So transferring these images onto the surface of the soap was a way to invert and purify these simplistic representations. And I should say that I consider everyone to be an offender. At some point in time, everyone has broken a law, whether one was caught or not. Jaywalking, drinking underage, trying marijuana, driving after a few drinks, they're all violations of the law. So the images vary from celebrities and politicians to individuals charged with crimes. I also began collecting used decks of prison playing cards to protect and conceal the soaps as I mailed them home through the prison system. The cards came about after hearing individuals gamble through the bars of their cells. And they couldn't actually see each other. So unlike traditional card games, which are based on deceit, bluffing, body language, and performance, this new game is based on trust because of the conditions in which it must be played. The individuals couldn't see each other or the cards being played, so they had to verbally call out each card that was played and trust that it was the accurate card being played. This new game is paradoxical and revealing. It reveals the extent to which vision is the dominant sense through which we experience the world and interact with others. In time, this project developed into a series of 300 soaps and playing cards. After spending a year in this environment and creating this body of work, it was time for me to be sentenced. 
I ended up signing an open plea agreement for five to 40 years and agreed to argue the drug weights at sentencing. I was eventually found guilty of 500 grams of cocaine, which is substantially less than the 50 kilos that I was charged with. For that, I received a six-year federal prison sentence, and the judge recommended that I go to a low-security facility as close to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and my family as possible. Instead, the Bureau of Prisons sent me to Butner, North Carolina, to a maximum security penitentiary disguised as a medium security facility. So as a nonviolent offender, I was now surrounded by some of the most notoriously violent individuals, gangs, and criminal organizations in the world. The violence of the prison is real. It is overly sensationalized, but it is real. There are many ways that a six-year prison sentence could result in a life sentence or the end of your life within this environment. So I began creating a surrogate body of sorts that would come to represent the things that were revealed to me in the event that I never made it out. The violence of the prison is real, but it is not the violence enacted by the individual or the collective confined within the prison walls. It's the violence of the walls themselves, the architecture, the design, and the violence of the state. Prison as a form of social control is violence and anyone placed within its walls is at risk of falling victim to its designs. This got me thinking about the architectural structure of the prison and its designs to control bodies and vision. Much like the design of the prison, the camera and processes of photography also control vision. All systems and technologies of capture, containment, control, and visibility influence our views and behaviors. Captured images, bodies, and narratives, represented or not represented, influence our subjective experience. To capture someone from society and make them invisible is just as powerful as capturing one's image and surrounding it with a narrative. They are both forms of controlling representation and narrative. As I read the newspaper, I started to notice paradoxes between the images and the visual and the textual narratives that surrounded them and I began disconnecting the images from their textual narratives. I would then transfer these images onto federal prison bed sheets using hair gel and a plastic spoon. I blended these images together to create new visual narratives. I smuggled these works through the prison system piece by piece over a period of three years. The sheets as a material are also a very important conceptual element to the work. These sheets are produced in prison using inmate labor at 23 cents an hour in a program called Unicor to create products that are in competition in the private market. Unicor consistently has revenues over $747 million a year. The prison industrial complex is our modern day plantation. But instead of cotton, we now produce sheets, curtains, desks, chairs, plaques, apparel, electronics, and even solar panels. So using these sheets as a material was a way to reveal this hidden process of, of production. In the end, Apocalyptine measured 15 feet by 40 feet and consisted of 39 federal prison bed sheets. The title comes from the Greek origin of the word apocalypse meaning to uncover and reveal an event involving destruction and damage on a catastrophic scale. I coupled this with my Bureau of Prisons identification number. Making these works was considered contraband. Destroying and defacing federal property was a violation of institutional policy. But I knew that the guards, like most people in society, are not able to read material language. So as I established and instructed art classes, I was able to order materials out of art supply catalogs. I ordered one roll of canvas with no intention of using it as a material. When I received the order, I took the canvas labels off the canvas, the canvas off the roll, and I placed my sheets on the roll and the canvas labels on my sheets.
By doing this, I knew that I would create a surface appearance that would pass unrecognized in front of their eyes. Every object, image, and material has a latent language. And the way that is put together through process, placement, and composition influences our views and how we interact with others. When seeing someone for the first time, we form opinions and value judgments of that person based off of their surface appearance and our preconceived notions. We quickly determine if someone is being genuine or performing a facade. Prison is a place of perpetual performance, a theater of confinement, where over time all things get stripped bare and you are able to see things for what they really are and not just what they present themselves to be on the surface. This is not the case in society. The vastness of space and rate of time in society allows these same performances to continue without being revealed. The rise of social media and other technologies have served to increase these surface experiences and create hyperlinks in performativity. These technologies and more traditional media have always spread information across vast audiences, flattening time and space while creating empathy or apathy in the viewer based off of a virtual experience. The nuance and complexity of the actual experience is stripped down to a simple narrative that influences our societal norms. But I would argue that there is a third effect that is much more crucial and relevant to our existence. Constantly being overworked and overloaded with information makes us less introspective and more vulnerable to act in ways that are incongruent with who we really are. Today, I'm presenting, I'm performing, and in some aspects, so are all of you. The way we present ourselves in public is a performance. The nature of performance and the surface appearance of objects are identical. The surface of an object conceals what is interior, and the performance of the individual masks one's true thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and biases. And if we cannot see in, complex, in complexity, the surface not only conceals what is interior, but comes to represent that object as a whole. The surface becomes the object, the image becomes the individual, and if we are not introspective, the performance becomes us. Since returning home, I've created the Providential Machine. This work houses live male betta fish in plexiglass containers. Male betta fish are known for their beautiful colors and glorious fins, and are typically referred to as angelfish. However, they are also highly aggressive and territorial, and will kill any other fish that comes near it. In fact, even if they see another fish through the glass of their container, they will become highly agitated and confrontational. Their surface appearance makes them beautiful, but their actions are paradoxical. I place these containers, some with image transfers of domestic interiors and some without, in various domestic objects. The image transfers of domestic interiors versus the actual objects creates a space of virtual reality and reality. When the fish is contained within this structure, it cannot see the walls built around it, and the inch width does not allow it to turn sideways. I allowed the fish to have vision and to see, but only see what I wanted it to. Through my designs and placement, the beta existed in their own world, making them docile even though they were side by side with other male betas. In this constructed world, the transferred images become the same as the actual objects. They both become virtual experiences when viewed through a glass, a lens, a screen, a cell, or a surface that controls and confines vision. In very similar ways, society is a macrocosm of incarceration. Being able to see all things in complexity allows us to see past the surface, the performance, and the individual. It allows us to see the systems, structures, and environments that shape our existence. No one is simply good or bad, right or wrong, 
just or unjust. Everyone is complex. My work is not abolitionist or dogmatic. I am not telling you what to think. I am only encouraging you to think. In a fast-paced society where surface representations and virtual experiences influence how we see ourselves and interact with others, it's important to see in complexity because it allows us to become active, empowered participants in changing our views and in changing our views, changing our world. Thank you.